Good evening, everyone. I'm Judy Lubin with the Center for Urban and Racial Equity, or CURE for short. Thank you so much for joining us for what is the fourth in our series on conversations on uh, Black community development. And this evening, we're focusing on reparations, right? Long overdue reparations. Um, and so the session titled today is Reparations Reconstructing uh, Black Wealth and Economic Prosperity. I am co-moderating today's session with uh, my colleague, Ron. Are you gonna be joining us on camera? I'm... Okay. All right, well, while Ron um, joins us on camera, um, we're gonna invite folks again to let us know who you are, if you'd like to share and where you're, where you're, where you're um, uh, joining us from and anything else you'd like to share, especially in the context of the conversation this evening. Okay, um, am I, am I audio? We have your audio. Oh, great, great. Well, I'm trying to get my camera together. Um, thank you, Judy. Um, well, we're here today, and as, as you already know, that we're here for a, a, a wonderful conversation, um, hopefully inspiring um, for those in the listening audience. We're going to ask that you um, pose your questions. Uh, we're going to take questions around 8 o'clock, so you can put your questions in the question box and we'll upload them for the panelists. Um, I do want to just take a moment just to introduce um, our three uh, panelists. Um, Amber Henley um, is a Chicago resident and she's with a project in Chicago called Restitution Homes. And so uh, they have been doing research in Chicago uh, over the years on a process that's been called contract lend um, contract selling that has been used as a, a process to exploit wealth from black Chicagoans who were looking at purchasing homes in, in the Chicago metropolitan area back in the 50s I assume from the 40s up until almost the 70s and so so she's with us to talk about the work that they've been doing around looking at reparations and through the lens of restitution. Um, Dr. Raymond Wimbush is a professor at Morgan State University who's written extensively about the Black plight in America. And so he'll be sharing his viewpoints in terms of his research that he's done and, and his viewpoints on, on reparations uh, today um, and as we see them um, playing out um, legislatively as well as locally in local governments. Our third uh, presenter is Carmen Herreras Noble. Um, Carmen is a is director of the Community Development Clinic at SUNY Law School in New York City. Uh, her work has been very extensive in terms of working with cooperatives, not only just in New York City, worker owned cooperatives in New York City, but she's been uh, uh, published around the work around cooperatives as a as a model to increase uh, wealth opportunities in Black communities, and so she'll share uh, some of that work as well as her thoughts on how reparations have been playing out uh, as a conversational piece, particularly over these last three months with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so, Reverend um, Dr. Judy, would you want to go ahead and, and and get to some of the, the first questions that we want to share with the um, audience this evening. Um, and before I do that, I do want to just just lay some groundwork around why we're having this conversation. You now, racism has been an economic generator in America since 1619, uh, when Blacks were first brought here as enslaved people. Whites have knowingly, intellectually, devise a system that has benefited them through political to politics that benefited benefited them socially as well as economically and so why it's widely known that for 250 years through slavery we moved to 
90 years of Jim Crow. And from Jim Crow, we went to another 60 years of the separate but equal policies in this country. And as George Floyd has said, get your knee off my neck, it seems like it's a time now for America to take the, their knee off the neck of black folks and black communities. And so we know that, you know, this has not been a, a, a easy conversation to have over the 401 years that we've been going through these different processes, all with the same outcomes. But we also do know that if we're going to move forward in terms of healing this country and bringing people together, there has to be some atonement for what has happened in the past. And there has to be some apologies levied by those who know knowingly have done wrong against a group of people. So I don't want folks to think that this is a, a conversation where we're not recognizing that there's a there's a healing space in this conversation as well. And we want to drive that kind of conversation as well. Normally, there's some things that have to lead to uh, outcomes that elevate this conversation around represent, reparations and, and restitution. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Dr. Judy? Thank you, Ron. I, I really appreciate um, your acknowledgement that when we're talking about reparations, we're talking about healing and repair and restoration. And so before this session, you know, I was just sitting here taking some notes, right, that, you know, money is just one aspect, one important political aspect of the process of reparations, right? And that reparations is a tool for healing and restoring the ability self-determination. Um, uh, it's about restoring harmony and balance, right? That we want to be in right relationship, as you mentioned, Ron, right? 400 plus years of racial oppression, and we're still continuing to experience this oppression. And so in this moment where we're seeing, you know, this massive response as a result of the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many uh, other um, names that we have come to know as a result of police violence, um, that we have to name, right, this historical harm, but that redress is needed as a result of this uh, historical harm, um, redress for the theft of people, for the theft of labor, centuries of oppression as a result of Jim Crow laws, lynching, redlining, mass incarceration, um, and police violence. So I was digging into um, the history around calls for reparation, and as we know, this is we're we're entering this conversation on the 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 shoulders of ancestors that have that have led and uh, led this fight and struggle. Um, so I just want to call a few names. Um, in 1788, uh, 83, Belinda was an 80-year-old black woman who was enslaved in Massachusetts, and she petitioned her former owner to pay restitution uh, for benefiting. For her, for, from her free labor. Callie House, through the leadership of the National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief Bounty and Pension Association, led a movement of over 300,000 former enslaved people to petition for reparations. John Conyers, Representative John Conyers, who we lost last year for over 20 years since 1989, has introduced HR 40 the bill to study reparations and the process for uh, making rec recommendations for a remedy. Um, and Representative Sheena Jackson Lee, who was taking up this charge um, with her reintroduction of uh, HR 40. And so it's important that we call, call the names of the people that have led us to be where we are right now, where we're seeing such incredible momentum that we've never seen before around this issue. And so that's, Right, that that we recognize the importance of our forebear our forebearers and our ancestors. And so, uh, to our panelists, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward for to uh, to our conversation this evening. And we wanted to start off um, first by asking you, um, where do you think we are in this particular moment in the struggle for reparations? There seems to be a movement around particularly on public opinion there certainly has been momentum um, in terms of uh, conversations 
uh, earlier this year in the presidential debates, right? We heard, you know, almost every candidate said they supported, at the very least, they supported HR, HR 40. Um, and so I'd love for you to, you know, help us um, contextualize the current moment. What are you seeing, feeling in terms of the possibilities and opportunities? Well, I'll speak quickly and first. Um, there's two names you got to put on that list that you gave, Dr. Judy. Uh, the one is the great grandmother of a guy by the name of W. B. Du Bois, Mum Bet. Uh, she actually filed uh, filed a petition in Massachusetts one year prior to uh, uh, Belinda Royale. And another name that I, some of us actually remember, uh, uh, Queen Mother Moore who in 1963, you know, filed, brought a 200,000 signature petition to none other than John F. Kennedy asking for reparations. Those are just two names I think are important. Um, I think where we are right now is where we've been since Mumbet filed her petition in 1781, um, that she won that case as well as Belinda, by the way, and I think where we are now is that we're seeing reparations occurring right now. Asheville, North Carolina is a good example. Uh, Evanston, Illinois as well. That both of these cities have voted for, um, you know, implementing a form of reparations for uh, its African-American population. Uh, the city of Burlington, Vermont, just a couple days ago, and uh, Amherst, Massachusetts also voted likewise. And I think the momentum is very simple, and I'll be quiet on this point, but um, for 500 years, you know, African people all over the world, not just in the United States, not just in the Caribbean, but in as far away as Australia, have been cleaning up the mess of European colonizers and enslavers. And, you know, and that, that mess has taken the form of health issues, uh, educational deficits, uh, medical experimentation, and a whole host of atrocities during the period of enslavement. And I think the only thing that Black folk are asking for is compensatory measures to deal with that. Uh, there's no price tag, although I can give some figures on that, but <laughs> we won't do that now, but there's no price tag you can put on the suffering of Black folk but the fact of the matter is, is that reparations have had price tags put on them. Uh, for example, the Japanese incarceration uh, during 19, uh, World War II with that very, very radical president, Ronald Reagan. So I'll stop there, but I think we're in good shape right now. The movement has uh, had a tremendous amount of uh, momentum in the past few months, but it's always been the thread that runs through uh, African-American history. Thanks for getting us started, Dr. Winbush, Amber, and Carmen. Where, what's your sense of where we are right now? Wanna go, Amber? <laughs> sure. Um, well, my, my concern, there's a lot of momentum right now, um, and that's very exciting. But I do think that we have to be very strategic and calculated in how we make these moves for lasting change. Um, and in terms of the regional and the local reparations movements, I love it. I'm, I'm in Chicago right here from Evanston, and I think it's great what, what is happening. Um, but I'm just getting nervous that these local movements could take away from like what we really should be getting through black reparations as it relates to the 83% of the American history where we had legal forms of slavery and Jim Crow apartheid. Um, and I just, that's just my concern is that we're very excited and I want us to be excited, but I really want us to really think about this. Um, and there's been groups who have been thinking about this since 87. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm excited, but I just want us to really, really, really think about what is our goal here and how do we see reparations? What do we want reparations to do? Do we want it to be lasting? Um, I just want us to ask these questions and do a lot more research um, as we move forward. 
Mm -hmm. I'm, in, I'm definitely in favor of research in terms of how we move forward and make sure that it's lasting. Um, I'm definitely a believer in that there's a growing momentum and we should move on that. And at the same time, I still feel like we are up against a lot. And right now we cannot rely on the federal government to step in in the way we could have in the past. And it's great to see local cities and states stepping up and doing their part, um, but we need more. And it would be also nice to see cities and states coordinating to um, learn from each other and actually have it be, you know, learn best practices. And, but I think for me, like the HR 40 and the commission to study reparations, a lot of times I am, even as an academic, I'm a little put off by the amount of money that gets put into studying something that we know already know is a problem and it's well documented. Um, it's an example of the Ivy League school that got $10 million to study poverty while their, um, while their cafeteria folks were on strike because they were being underpaid. I mean, we know what the problem is and I'm at the point where I feel like I wanna focus on getting us outcomes. And I'm not trying to convince you that slavery was wrong and that it still impacts us today, because if you haven't learned that by now, you're committed to not knowing it, in my view. So that's a place from where I start. And then I try to, because I'm also a lawyer, try to work with organizations and coalitions on the ground that are working on creating Black wealth and ensuring Black health right, especially during this time of a pandemic. And we have also seen that this pandemic has exposed what we all already know, that particularly the black community is particularly vulnerable because of all the systemic racism in every single institution that exists. There's no institution that does not have racism as a part of it. Um, so I also think it's our job kind of immediately to look inward and look at our own organizations and institutions and see how we can do the reparations work within first and then also working with others. Okay. Um, go ahead, go ahead, Ray. Well, I, I got to ask something real quick. Um, okay. I was on HR 40 in 1989, the one that Congressman Conyers uh, introduced is not the same HR 40 now. Uh, I was on the committee that rewrote it three years ago. Um, and we said, look, we've got enough studies. Uh, we have Randall Robinson's book, The Debt. There's literally hundreds of articles that have been written about reparations since 1989. I don't want to sound self-serving, but the two books that I've written about it. Um, what we did in the revision that was right before the, uh, the well, you could say the committee that Sheila Jackson Lee chaired uh was to talk about remedies i mean tangible remedies so if you look at hr 40 revised which is about three years old you'll see a totally different bill practically from hr 40 the one that congressman conyers uh introduced um and i think the other thing that we need to talk about and hopefully we'll be able to do some of that is the forms of reparations um you know, drug dealers such as Rush Limbaugh have tried to make it appear as, as if everybody's going to get a check in the mail. Um, uh, Robert Johnson, the former owner of uh, BET, came out a couple weeks ago and said, just give every black man, woman, and child of African descent in the United States 350000 uh, which totals out to about $14 trillion. That's one remedy. And some people will get cash payments, but there's also scholarships. There's also my Caribbean brothers and sisters. They're talking about, many of them are talking about repatriation back to Africa. Uh, there's tax breaks. There's a reparations bank model out there. So there's a dozen models out there, and we've got to make sure that we, you know, talk about which one we are talking about. Uh, Ray. Um... Thank you. Um, let me ask this question of the panel. Um, and Amber, this is your question about reparation and, and a definition for reparations. 
So what is the difference between reparations and equity? So, Amber, I'll, I'll, your was your question. I'm going to ask that you respond to that question first. Okay. So for me, reparations, when I think in terms of Black reparations, I think of um, slavery, Jim Crow apartheid, and then continuing discrimination. Um, that's specific to the things that have happened during slavery, Jim Crow apartheid, the things that where we lacked full citizenship throughout that entire course of American history that is specific um, to Black Americans and descendants of, of, of formerly enslaved peoples. Um, I think of equity as things like making sure that we have our fair share of contracts and school funding and um, investing in infrastructures and creating programs that make communities more equitable even if they are specifically black communities but it's just about the equity and bringing us up to a certain medium here and now but i think they're two different things okay how about your thoughts on that common uh, you yeah i mean I, I, I agree with Amber. I think they're, you know, they are two different things, um, although they're definitely related. But we really can't talk about equity until we fix the rep reparations problem. So mm -hmm. when we, you know, when some people say, well, a good reparations would be we will give scholarships for folks, black folks to go to college. Okay, well, what about my preschool kid? I don't have a preschool kid. But you know, it's like you can't just pick a spot and say that that's going to fix things because it's interlocking systems of oppression. And for me, in terms of equity, I, I do think about housing first. Um, and also it, I, housing is on my mind because we're about to really see a crisis of a lot of people. I mean, we already had a crisis in homelessness, but it's gonna increase with this pandemic. And any kind of community development that has occurred in the past has really started with anchoring people and that anchoring was through housing. So for me, I think we need to we need to help anchor folks in their housing, as well as provide resources for community development. And our, I mean, right now everybody's doing everything from home, but also that all our neighborhoods have the institutions that we expect and thrive on, libraries, um, churches, different recreational centers. There are plenty of communities that don't have basic infrastructure like Amber was saying, and we really need that infrastructure. Um, and I think, you know, we have a history of being a collective people. And that's why I like to focus on cooperative ownership, both in the housing context and in terms of worker ownership, where the workers are also the owners of the business. And by being owners of the business, it's not just replicating the status quo, but adhering to certain principles that make sure that there's equity and pay and also that people are treated with value um, so that corporations aren't the new overseers of our people. Okay. Uh, Ray, you want to you want to add to 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 that definition of reparations versus equity? Well, I mean, the word reparations, I mean, just quickly, I mean, it wasn't even used to about 1914, right after World War One. Uh, the French coined reparation as they call it, which is really ironic since Haiti paid reparations to France for over a hundred years, amounting to well over $3 billion. And we asked then, why is Haiti so poor? Because they were extorted by the French in 1825. That's a whole nother discussion. But uh, reparations, I mean, the legal definition, and uh, you correct me, Carmen, if I'm wrong on this, but my the activist part of me says, and actually the UN as well, is when a nation has committed a crime against humanity against a specific group. And so we know, for example, that Maori of New Zealand had crimes against uh, humanity committed against them, uh, Jewish people during the Holocaust. Uh, in this country, very you know many indigenous groups and reparations were paid the japanese as i mentioned earlier equity you know sometimes i think america you know like tanahasi coach says we operate on these myths about stuff you know and 
you know, Ta-Nehisi talks about in his first, uh, his book, uh, what is it called, Against the World or whatever, Me and the World or whatever. You know, Coates talks about the need for Americans to take a hard look at their past and really be honest about their past. Equity implies that somehow all things will be the same. But as a, you know, as a social scientist, I've got to look at the fact that I've always got to factor in how racism, white supremacy mediates so much of our discussion, as Carmen says. There's no institution in this country that's immune from the, you know, the effects of racism. So when we talk about equity in terms of housing, schooling, and so forth, we have got to talk about a whole lot of other things about why there is not equity in those institutions and getting at the root of that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Judy, you want to uh, pass the medal and you want to pose a question to the audience? I mean, yeah, I would just add, right, like, you know, we have equity in the name of <laughs> my organization, right? Like, and for, for us, right, equity is that, right, that we are um paying attention to those things right that like we're not seeking equality right equality says we assume everything will be equal um that we're not starting off from from different uh positions and that we're not paying uh attention to historical processes and current and historical processes that are continuing to reproduce um the inequities that we're that we're experiencing so, so we want to hear, Dr. Uh, Winbush, you, you, you asked this question about the forms of reparation. So, you know, I'm curious to hear from you, um, from all three of you, what do you think of as reparations, right? Um, is, some people say reparations requires cash payments, whereas others will argue that reparations can take different forms. And so, so what do you define as reparations? Well, the forms of reparation, it, it, if I can make an analogy real quick, you know, in 1954, Brown v. Board desegregated schools, but spinoffs from that, you know, uh, was the Equal Opportunity Act, uh, Open Housing, the Voting Rights Act, you know, this spun off of that within a 10 year period. It's the same thing with reparations. I think when most people think about reparations, especially those who are opposing it, the uh, the first thing they think about, oh, you're going to give away, you know, free cash money to black folk or something like that. It's not true. Reparations are a form of justice. So if I break out Amber's uh, windows in her car and I look at them and Amber knows I broke the car windows out and I say, well, Amber, I'm sorry for breaking your window. You'll say, OK, Ray, I'm glad you you apologize, but I need some kind of compensation. And I'm saying that because of the broken windows of history, enslavement, separation of families, a variety of things, that you've got to repair that damage in some tangible way. A couple of years ago, real quick, I was asked to participate in a, I guess it was a ceremony down in Annapolis here in Maryland, and they said they wanted me to be the slave master and the white people wanted to be the enslaved people and we were going to apologize for that well i told them you know thanks but no thanks i couldn't do that uh, you know uh, you know apologies without you know some type of compensatory you know ec equity or whatever is empty so reparation can take the form of money. They can take the form of scholarships to schools. Uh, they can take the form of tax breaks. Um, I mean, what if uh, my colleague Charles Barron on the uh, Assemblyman in New York, he says, what if we said Black folk wouldn't have to pay any form of taxes, income, sales, whatever, for the next 10 years? That's a form of reparations, repatriation, which I mentioned earlier. So it takes a variety of forms, and it's not just the check in the mail, which I think oftentimes gets a lot of publicity, and it's not just that. Well, you know, after World War II, the U.S. government rebuilt Europe. 
um, they they committed um, over a four year period over eighteen billion dollars to rebuilding Europe, Europe, and that's rebuilding uh, uh, from the ground up. That's building rebuilding their institutions and building their economies. And I did a a, a quick an, uh, an analogy, and I looked at that eighteen billion dollars that was given to Europe in 1948, I think it was 15 billion in 1948. And I put it in the context of today's dollars in 2020. Right now, that 15 billion billion would be 160 billion, over, over 160 billion, $400,000 in today's dollars. And so we do know that um, one of the things that, and I'm glad you, uh, you all have recognized that we're not just asking and no one has just asked for monetary compensation because we know that um, that's not gonna get us where we need to be at. Um, there has to be education for, uh, as a part of the, the equation. Carmen mentioned housing as a part of the equation. And, but more importantly, this country and those who, who have benefited have to have a willingness to change their perspective attitudes and consciousness because you can give me all the money in the world but if you ain't still feeling about me the way you feel about me and if i walk into your place of ownership your place of business and you're still looking at me as three-fifths of a human being truly have i really truly been compensated um and i think that's where we are i, I want to read this quote and then I'm going to pass this uh, mic on to Reverend, uh, excuse me, Dr. Judy again. And this quote by Robert, Robert Kennedy, which he made in just before his death in, in, in 1968. It's almost indicative of the times we're in now. He says, our country is in danger, not just from foreign enemies, but above all, from our own misguided policies and what they can do to this country. There's a contest not for the rule of America, but for the heart of America. Uh, during last year's presidential campaign, uh, we heard from Marianne Williamson, who's one of the candidates, talk about the soul of America, and that America needs to, to repent and atone and bring whole those atrocities and injustices that this country has committed over the years. And I'm quite sure she wasn't speaking to every single person in the country, but those who have benefited and, and done the vicious acts of perpetrating uh, the racist acts against uh, people of color, uh, the businesses that have benefited, um, the institutions that have benefited. Um, we're still in, in DC, you know, Georgetown University is still working out its reparation plan for the over 200 slaves that were sold to pay off the that college's debt in, in the 1700s. Um, so yes, so I'm gonna move my mic over back to uh, Dr. Judy, let her ask the next question um, of you all. Thank you. I did wanna respond to the different um, programs for reparations. I think um, one of my driving passions is the 40 Acres and a Mule, Sherman's uh, Bill Order Number 15 that laid out everything in my opinion, very beautifully for us to have a fresh start. We started at a deficit because of the situation. We were just f newly freed, um, but it gave us land. It gave us military protection. So, so we wouldn't have to worry about white terror campaigns. It gave us a black belt where we could rebuild as a community and figure out what our own identity was. And then I'm sure we would have integrated a little bit into society, but it would have been on our own free will after we would have like figured out what our life should have looked like for us at that time. Um, and my arguments are based on the fact that if we were given 40 acres and a mule, when I calculated it was about two acres per family or per person, but if we were given that in full accordance in 1865, we would not be where we are today. The black, white, all of the disparities would not be what they are today. The black white disparities would not exist. I do not believe in that manner. So I think when we, when we talk about building out plans, you have to also consider that and I do think that we need a comprehensive plan that include that addresses issues of mental health, education, re-educating all of America, white, black, and other. But also, we do need a direct payment. 
that has to be a part of any reparations plan. I would argue a direct payment has to be a part of it. And I also argue that that cannot be the only part of it. Um, funds have to touch everything, but a direct payment should be a necessary requirement for, for these reparations that I speak of. Dude, I agree. Go ahead. I was going to say, I definitely agree that, you know, I actually get upset when people say, well, no, there shouldn't be a direct payment. That speaks to me, that says a lot about the person speaking to me when I hear that. Yeah. There should be a direct payment. Um, and as you said, Amber, there should be other parts of it. And Dr. Winbush has um, identified them as well. Um, but to go back to Juan's statement about consciousness and also re-educating not just Black people, but all people, we have not had we have not had truth and reconciliation we do not teach in school how bad slavery actually was and in terms of um, and i don't know how many times to this day i have to say to people slavery was not just about not being paid for your work it was chattel slavery you need to know the difference it was generational families were separated we know this stuff but i am always shocked and to be candid for Paul, when people really, I think they're trying, they're being earnest and really don't have a real sense of how deep it goes um, and what the ramifications are. And then you hear about places like Germany where they make sure they, they put that into their curriculum and it's taught within the school so that you never go back to that shameful experience. Whereas here, it's like, oh, well, you know, then you get all the, the stereotypes um, and it's like, really, you you have a lot of nerve calling anybody lazy when you enslave the whole people. Um, so I think it's important to teach them young. I mean, it's it's a it's a hard conversation, but we can't spare our kids from the conversation, so no one should be spared. And it and it hurts everybody. So it really is a hard conversation that has to have ha happen as early as possible. Um, because I think you get a, that's why you get a lot of deniers. Yeah. You're yeah. And I'll tell you another thing, what Amber said is so important about the whole land issue and the teaching of history. Uh, a lot of people don't know after Sherman uh, introduced Field Order Number 15, there was actually 400,000 acres distributed to Black folk between uh, January 15th and April 14th of 1865. Of course, on April 14th, 1865, Lincoln was assassinated. Uh, Johnson took his place and he took the 400,000 acres and gave it back to the former enslavers saying that they had suffered the most during the Civil War. So th those are those pieces of history you will never hear. And, had, and, and I agree with you, Amber, have we had that land? Hell, I would take five acres, but, you know, but, and there really was no mule in there, but, you know, having a, you know, if you sold people land in those days, it was like selling, saying, look, I'm going to sell you a Lexus, but it doesn't have any engine in it. I mean, they just assumed that it would have the, uh, the mule. But if we had had that, no telling what would have happened. And finally, the land that Sherman wanted us to have was what is now Hilton Head, South Carolina, yes. some of the richest real estate in the country. And it, and it actually says in the field order, that no white people should be there. But I, I could really, that's a whole nother discussion too. <laughs> I would like to point out that it also included wonderful areas in Georgia. Savannah would have been there. Um, St. Augustine, it went all the way from oh, South no, that, Carolina all the way right. down to Florida. That's right. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. So I have a couple follow-up questions. Um, Carmen, you mentioned, right, that there hasn't really been a truth and reconciliation process that has happened here in this country. And so I'd love to hear from you all what you think that should look like, you know, certainly as part of reparations, right, that you have to have that larger conversation and discussion um, than the, the truth telling, right? And so what, what should that look like? Because folks, some folks will say, well, haven't we been having a conversation about race and racism for 50, 60? years now what would be different about a truth and reconciliation process in the u.s and are there places like south africa or other um, places around the world that we can learn from i 
I think it has to start with the re-education piece. Um, people have to really understand why they should apologize and what they're apologizing for. And one of my main, um, another one thing that I'm very interested in is changing the history, history curriculum starting in grade school. Um, that has to be taken care of. The truth has to be told at earlier ages. When I think about, I, I don't even, I don't even know the true story about Native Americans. Um, mm. If I just go based off of what I learned in, in grammar school, I mean, it was a really nice picnic on Thanksgiving Day. Just different that that has to be addressed. I think that you start there with re-educating people because people are not sorry because they don't really understand. They do believe this false narrative. Um, so I think before it has to be a re-education component. Again, I agree with Amber. When I was a child thousands of years ago, uh, you know, I was cheering Davy Crockett at the Alamo. And very few people know that what is now Texas, Arizona, Nevada, California, belonged to Mexico. But I, like many other miseducated people in this country, thought that Davy Crockett was a hero, you know, and, and so was, who was that other guy, Sam Houston and all of those guys. And, and they were, they were invaders of Mexico. I told this to audiences, white audiences primarily, and they'll look at me and say, well, that's just not true. You know, Americans probably know less about this country's history than some people that I've met in places like France and Europe. And, and, and insofar as the truth of reconciliation, I'm not trying to drop a name, but uh, when I was teaching at Fisk, uh, Nantumbi Tutu, Bishop Tutu's daughter, was worked for me. And, you know, the Archbishop would always say, the problem with you Americans is that you never had a truth and reconciliation uh, commission that should have happened right after the Civil War because Americans have lied to themselves over and over again in textbooks, in TV shows, in cartoons, and in the Disney world about the history of this country. And we, until we face the, the absolute history of this country with regards to indigenous people, black people, immigrants, everyone, we are never gonna understand who we are as so-called Americans. Mm. And I think a lot of that truth is historical sharing of knowledge, but also the present day about how white people still benefit. And they need to accept that because it's just the truth and a fact. And it's not to say that they didn't work hard for what they had, but not everybody was given, a lot of people work hard and don't get that same benefit. Um, and I find that that's, Usually people are like, well, I worked really hard and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't alive back then. Okay, well, if you have something stolen in your house and someone comes and says, hey, that was stolen from me, are you going to keep it in your house or are you going to give it back? That's right. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm not asking you to give it back in its entirety, but there may be some things that you get overlooked on because you already benefited, and especially in terms of redlining and housing. Um, I don't see you saying, oh, because black people were excluded, you know, I'm gonna give the equity in my home to, you know, a black program or a black organization, or just give it back, give it back to the government and then have the government redistribute it. Um, there has to be a willingness to say, just I use this example and it's 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 very basic, but it really resonates with me being a New Yorker. When you're out there and I see a black man trying to flag a cab, if I, even if it's raining, if the cab stops for me, I'm not getting in it. I'm gonna let my brother get in first and I'm gonna wait for the next cab because I know what that's about. And I feel like that's what I'm personally asking my white colleagues and friends to do as well, is that you, we have to be in this together. But if you're not in it with us, we will do it without you. Because the time is now, it's, it's been time, we're over time, mm -hmm. um, is my belief. You know, um, you know, the racism that runs through this country is like gangrene. Mm -hmm. And if you got gangrene in your baby toe or your big toe, it's gonna spread 
eventually through your whole body. And so in order to save your whole body, you have to amputate that toe so that the gangrene doesn't spread. And so we've allowed this racism to continue to spread even today. We're still seeing voter suppression. You know, at the at the turn of the century, well, actually after after doing reconstruction, we had and uh, and professor, you can uh, um, quote me. Uh, I think we had like four states where there were black senators. Yeah, um, and once they uh, did a black governor. Yeah, the and then governor. after Johnson took over after Lincoln's um, assassination, he turned back everything back into the hands of the Southerners because right. he was a southern, southern, a poor Southerner himself. And so, if we had to look ahead now to this election that's going to happen in a few months. What kind of things should we be thinking or wanting to put on the national agenda in this country? Uh, we have the bill, yes. But how can we move this conversation even further in our local local Jewish, local cities, our state governments, and up to our national government in terms of looking at policies around bringing about the reconstruction of black wealth and economic prosperity. And when I say uh, black wealth, yes, there's a monetary uh, part of the wealth, but also there's there's in in there are things that have happened to us as black people that money will not solve. The trauma that we've gone through and continue to go through that's passed on generationally to our kids. And how do we start to address that and and bring the, the healing back as a result of all this trauma that we've experienced for ourselves? You know, we talk about violence in the Black community and we see, and we really sometimes even don't know what the root cause of the violence is. Now we find out that we drink bad water that's lead infested. And we know lead has a has a detrimental effect on, on the organic development of the brain. And so I think there's some research going on. Amber, you may uh, add to this, even in Chicago and other, uh, other cities about the effect of lead in the water and violence and the correlation between that. So what should we be looking at going forward um, in, in, a, in an optimistic way going forward in this political season that we're in now? You know, <laughs> I don't want to sound cynical or well, not cynical. Not <laughs> cynical. <laughs> you know, if someone, had, you know, I'm a child of the civil rights era of the 60s. And if someone had told me, and I'm very, I'm not exaggerating, if someone had told me in 2020 we would have a president of the United States who would call women nasty, that would be locking up brown children on the southern border. And and praising, you know, people in Charlottesville, you know, a couple of years ago about there's good people on both sides. I would have told them they were out of their mind. That would never happen. But it has happened. And again, I think it points to what Tanahasi says in his book about this country has never come to grips with how racist it is. Uh, the anger towards, I don't know if you're familiar with the 1619 Project, the New York Times, yes. which is a good place to start history. The anger towards a sister simply saying that slavery defined America and, and proves it. I mean, she is not she just saying this out of the clear blue sky, but actually proving it. And then that the blowback that she has gotten, she got the Pulitzer Prize, but she also got the blowback prize from white historians who insist upon these false narratives of who we are. Um, I think what we've got to do right now is work hard. Um, I've talked to several of my colleagues, not only at Morgan, but at other universities. And one colleague told me at William and Mary, uh, he said that the period between now and January 21st, uh, is going to be the most dangerous period in American history since the Civil War. I hope he's wrong, 
because she, he doesn't feel that this idiot is going to leave the White House peacefully. And he's also afraid of the people that are following this man in a very cult-like way. So I think we've got to be prepared for a lot of scenarios in the next six months, and some of which you know, are going to be probably shake us to our very core about what this country is all about. So I don't want to sound pessimistic, but that's what I feel like. I yeah. yeah. Well, your sentiments are uh, uh, a lot of what I hear as well. Uh, Amber and, and, and Carmen, you, either way you want to ch chime in? So when you said, I think you said positive, and then I went, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think well, this is time to make unflinching, unflinching demands mm -hmm. um, and call and, and and name what it is we need, investments in housing, investments in um, you know, low-income communities that are low-income communities because they've been disinvested, low-wage workers, they're low-wage workers because people, corporations are underpaying them. I think we need to name who the actors are and then mm -hmm. demand that those actors change. Um, and we can only do that collectively in terms of our power and as a concerted force. But I do think we need to make those demands and make them clear um, and ask for the, the, the range of reparations that we have already spoken about. But I definitely am thinking about, you know, the presidential debates, like, no, monetary payments definitely has to be part of reparations. Um, a universal plan to me is another way of erasing the Black experience in the U.S. and that just has to stop. It may sound like it could be pitched better or, or sold better, but the, it's not a marketing. It's not a marketing pitch. It's something that has to be done. It's restitution, like Dr. Wimbush was saying. If you break the windows of my car, you best believe, I don't even care if you don't apologize, you're gonna pay to get the windows fixed. And the US needs to pay up. Hmm. And well, there will be a lot of backlash from other communities. But when is there not going to be? If, exactly. I mean, I'm not living in fantasy land. Um, I don't, if we wait for that, we're never going to get anything. So I think, you know, like I was saying to Ron on an earlier call, like Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without demand, and we need to keep demanding. Hmm. That's rightfully ours. Amber? Yes, I think that we have to organize. Um, I think that we have to identify as individuals who care about these issues. We do have to identify organizations because I, there's power in that. Um, I think that's a really big thing is identifying who's doing this work and you need to join the movement and be active. Um, but we just have to we have to be more collective in our approaches. That's the that's the one thing that I worry about with us is that. We have a lot of organizations, um, but we need to come together and form some consensus. Like we don't all want the same things, but there are things that we all need and we have to find a way to come together around those issues and figure out the other pieces together. Um, so I'm just, I think we just need to really start thinking about how we're gonna marry our institutions because that's where the power is. We need that power to make these demands and to see them through. And to see that the change is generational. Um, that's my that's my comment. Okay. Well, we we we're, we're closing in on on the last few moments. Uh, Dr. Judy, is there something you want to ask or some comments you want to make as we close out um, this uh, first hour? Yeah. To follow up on Amber's point in terms of like, what are those institutions? we need to be connecting with if we're not already connected with or plugged in or part of um, that has been active um, around these issues, right? And COBRA has been uh, working on the issue of reparation since um, uh, the 1980s. And so, um, for, and then there are local groups, right, as well. And so for, for folks who um, want to name organizations, you know, what, should, what are those groups that you're thinking about in terms of you know, these are institutions that we need to be connecting with or trying to influence. Obviously, Congress is, you know, in terms of, you know, political institutions, but what are also the, the grassroots 
um, uh, organizations and the organizers that to be linking with. Well, I would definitely underline what you said about INCOBRA, National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, has been the group uh, since the 1980s uh, and is still very much active about pushing issues of reparation. Uh, also, the National uh, North American African American uh, Reparations Commission, uh, NARC, N A A R C, they're very active as well as INBUF, National Black United Front. That's another, all of these organizations should be, you know, contacted if you don't, if anybody needs their addresses, you can look them up on the internet or contact me directly. So there's a lot of activist groups. And I, I think what Amber said is also very important. You know, I always tell my students at Morgan that you can have a mobilization without having an organization. Mobilizations fail oftentimes. A good example of that some of us remember three or four years ago, the Occupy movement. Um, it was a mobilization. So I always say that, you know, a mobilization has to be organized into a movement. And I always tell my students, remember the word MOM, M O M, mobilizing, organizing, and then have it, uh, a movement. Unless the Black Lives Matter movement or mobilization right now becomes a movement is not it's going to fall apart and um you, if you study organizations they do so we've got to organize better as uh amber said and uh and cobra is, is an organization but we've got to organize a lot of the people uh to really get busy on this issue of reparation mm -hmm. thank you for that and then amber does someone want to say something? No, I was just going to say that I think, you know, another question that comes up with reparation is who's going to pay the government, um, in the individual families that built their wealth from slavery. And I think in terms of both, and a lot of individual families that built their wealth from slavery are quite wealthy. They have philanthropic arms to their businesses. And we all know that Black-led organizations are usually, if they get any money at all, they get the least amount. Um, so I think we need to put pressure on them as well to, in, to invest in Black-led movements. And it will also, I think, help us come together more effectively in terms of our coalition building that Amber was speaking about, because I find sometimes with nonprofits, it's a it's a competition for the funding. It's sad, but it's also like the reality of the situation. So I I, I think putting pressure on um, philanthropy is really important, and philanthropy is really just an arm of control of corporations. So I think um, that's an important aspect of actually getting resources into the community as well. Yeah. You know, I I would just want to add. You know, last week we had a discussion on wealth. And for years, I've been challenging white-led nonprofits around their work that they do in, in, in black and brown communities. Um, yes, they do get government funding and philanthropic funding to do work around affordable housing, small business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But none of that work they do is about building wealth in the black community. That's right. Yeah, all the resources that come in go right back out to white-led businesses or their consulting partners or folks that they have relationships with. And so when we start talking about challenging, yes, there's a lot of challenges that have to go on around um, uh, dismantling um, this whole institutional system that is working to the benefit of others at the disbenefit of so, other, so many others. Uh, it was the boys who said at the turn of the century, the battle is a, it's a color line, and it, we've not gotten away from that. Um, race is still an issue in this country that we don't talk about. And so as long as it's swept in dark corners and the crevices that it is, it allows others to, to take opportunity from that. And so um, you know, this discussion that we've been having, um, Dr. Judy and I have 
been having uh, with audiences for the last four weeks. Um, I see who comes and who and who's willing to to share in in an authentic way in this conversation. Um, and take some lessons away from this conversation that helps you become a better person, help you manage your organization in a better way, where you are looking um, equitably through your lens of how you work and partner with others, instead instead of taking the advantage of the situation and profiteering because of your your whiteness. And so um, so I, I'm going to be optimistic. I, I, I'm going to be optimistic that um, that um, that um, the, the song that Sam Cook sung way back in the 60s when I was a kid, a change is going to come. I'm going to I'm going to hold on to that and a change is going to come. May not in my lifetime, but I do believe a change is going to come in terms of turning this country upside down and and and, and putting a, a, um, a plan in place that brings wholeness and healing to to a people that have been um, so um, disbattered over time. So so yeah. So that's my um, ending. Ending. Uh, I do want to open up the the mics for any questions that. Um, the panel um, may have, and uh, uh, Dr. Judy, would you want to facilitate these questions? Sure. So we want to invite audience members to um, ask questions of our panelists. Um, drop your questions in the chat. I see one question here to get us started. So the question is, how is equitable distribution of taxpayer funds reparations? Reparations is about specific repair, is about repair for the specific people or victim of the crime against humanity, restricting taxes paid in the press. I didn't hear the last part of that. Mm -hmm. The last part says restricting taxes paid in the in the present. Um, how is equitable distribution of taxpayer funds reparations is the, the first part of the question. Well, if I understand the question correctly, America has really never had an equitable distribution of taxes in terms of what the results are. So Black people in this country pay taxes for schools they couldn't attend. They pay, you know, taxes for services they couldn't get, such as fire services, and in many cases, police services uh, during the Jim Crow era. So um, with one of the you know plans for reparation is that considered as some people may say look i would not like to pay taxes for x amount of years and we work that out um there's a lot of plans out there right now about reparations uh and i think that the taxes are just one direct payments must be made but so is land redistribution when I was doing some research a few years ago, we found out that the land in Florida where the Los Angeles Dodgers training camp was taken from black people during World War II and by the United States government and promised that it would be taken or given back after the war. So some people may want the land that was taken from them back. And we've talked to indigenous groups about this all around the country. So it's a, you know, it's interesting when you start talking about fair, uh, you know, reparations, many, you know, opposers to that will say, well, we've got to be fair about this. And I said, well, let's talk about the entire history of the United States and fairness and see where it lands us. That's another expression of cynicism, but go ahead. <laughs> And I'm looking at the last part of the, the question, and I'm wondering, the question looks like it's also asking that restricting taxes paid in the present, right? That, you know, is, is could, could reparations also be maybe that Black people don't pay taxes? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with that because wealthy people don't pay taxes. I mean, this issue of saying <laughs> don't pay taxes, you know, are you saying that Black people shouldn't pay taxes? I mean, Jeff Bezos doesn't pay taxes, you know? So, I mean, that's nothing, again, I think we have to understand how money 
is distributed, the tax system, how it's historically been biased against, you know, people of African descent. So all of that stuff, and again, it's the need for a national dialogue to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we have another question coming in, but, but to that point, right, that, and it's, it's something that Amber mentioned earlier at the beginning is that, right, do we risk potentially, that, potentially right, that a whole bunch of things start being called reparations? Um, and if there isn't like a consensus around what is reparations that as we often have seen, right, that a whole bunch of things, right, right, the term racial equity or racial justice gets popular and co-opted to start uh, these broad things that aren't really the practice of racial justice that's being called racial justice or racial equity work. And so like with reparations, um, that process of a consensus on what exactly reparations are and what they what they look like right could potentially if if that doesn't happen right that we can see a number of different organizations institutions start calling a, a program um reparations just because you're serving uh black communities that that's not necessarily reparations and i think in terms of advice for approaches um, the work is being done. So Evanston, they got together, they formed committees, they heard their residents out, they built out a plan. I think that's great. And I think we should be doing that. We should be looking at regional specific ways to make amends. But I would say we should still be having these local conversations, but instead of then acting on these plans, we should be coming together getting other cities involved, then getting mayors involved, then getting governors involved. And then let's, we're gonna build it up. We're doing the work at the ground level, but then we need to come together because the funds are not at the local or the state level to address the needs, to address reparations the way it needs to be done. There's not gonna be enough in the budget. It has to come from the federal government because it, so the estimates are anywhere from like 12 to $16 trillion to really address the needs based on like the research that has been done, historical data, economic data, models being built. It's it's going to take a lot. Um, but I think it should just be about, we need to have these conversations locally, but we need to build these institutions, build them up, go to mayors, mayors have to go to governors, however that works, but it has to, like we have to, we should be working on these things. But let's 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 get the money from where the money should come from let's get the amount of money that we need to really address these issues uh, that's uh, quick question um and i'm going to go back to this question in terms of looking at this um through the political eye um Dr. Wimbush, you, you said that what um, Congressman Khan has, um wrote in his earlier versions of, of House Bill 40 is different than, than what is being proposed right now by Congresswoman Lee. Um, what, what is the, the combined approach that we should be looking at legislatively that, that we should be pushing through Congress. If if Reverend, if um, Congresswoman Lee's uh, um, legislation is just around study, and I, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm familiar with what with, with, with Congressman Connors was writing uh, in his House bill, but if his bill had more teeth in it, how do we start to 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 promote his bill as 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 the as the bill that we think we want to see move forward? as opposed to just, as Carmen said, another study, another study. Well, okay, it's more than study. I checked right before this webinar. We have right now 139 signatories to, you know, to bring HR 40 revised to the floor of the House, uh, which will come through the Judiciary Committee. Um, when we get 150, and, and I can just tell you this straight up, that between now and December 31st, we're gonna have the 150 people 
that will bring it to the floor of the House. Uh, when a vote is taken, and it's more than just about a study, I want to underline that. And again, I would refer everybody to HR 40 revised. Uh, it's about remedies. It contains, this is what we need to do. The studies have already been made. And, and, and there's still many being made. But we want to talk about doing things. And that's why last Juneteenth in 2019, you probably saw the House Committee with Tanasi Hoats Coates and several other people testifying. Uh, Danny Glover was there, in fact, um, yeah. testifying about that. So HR 40 revised is much different from HR 40. If it gets passed, and we are right now 98% sure that it will be passed, we're going to have a vote by the end of the year. Um, and with that, and when that happens, you're going to start seeing at the legislative level uh, a lot of reparations, including the federal government that Amber was talking about. And then one other quick thing, real quick. I always say that there's like a glass model. You need G-L-A-S-S. -S. You need grassroots organization. You need legislators. You need attorneys like you, Carmen. You need students and you need scholars. Those are the five elements of every movement that has ever been those five groups. And right now, I think we, uh, the grassroots organizing is here in the form of the Black Lives Matter movement, which again, I think has to be more organized. Uh, the legislators are in place, the scholars are in place, the students are in place, and the grassroots, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the attorneys are harder to get, but they're getting in place. So I think when all those five elements come together, you're going to see a lot of move. Uh, before you move on, before the next, uh, the other spot, Dr. Wimbush, you, you mentioned that you need uh, how many more signatories on this, or uh, the signing? We need about anywhere between twelve and fifteen. Organizations uh, or, or individuals? Those are individual congressmen, uh, and okay. we're putting heavy duty pressure right now. Trust is, me on them. Is, is there something that you could send send me uh, yeah. that, that we I'll can send you along you. to our, our, our network? I'll give you the list of the Congress people who have not supported HR 40. And Thank some you. of them are black folk. And I'm well, being very I'm not the, surprised. The, the, the Congressional Black Caucus of 30 years ago that Congressman Conyers founded is not the same CBC now. And that's, that's a whole nother discussion too. Well, we, we had a part of the discussion last last week. It's true. <laughs> Antoine Th Thompson, who that's shared right. this. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, just a follow up, Dr. Winbush, is right, to clarify on the study, right? That the is this is a model that's been followed um, in terms of the commission that needs to be established to study, for example, the economic ramifications yeah. and then make recommendations right and that it's if we're right. following the model from uh the the payments for japanese americans yes. in fact several of the uh, one of the scholars uh you know consulted on the writing of hr 40 he was with the japanese uh uh folk when they got reparations in the 1980s so it's been it's been consulted widely um sheila jackson lee frankly and I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but she has been very aggressive, uh, a little bit more aggressive than uh, rest of soul John Conyers was about some of, you know, pushing this bill. I could say more, but I'm not going to say more. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, and, and but to that point, right, that there's even a resistance, right? Even when people think talk about it as like a study, right, that the folks who are resisting this understand like the study or the establishment of the commission is an important step towards actually achieving reparations? Well, it's a, it was a study of reparations. Some of that is in HR 40, but the bulk of it is about what remedies, and when these remedies are going to, when they're, they'll be presented for a vote, and then they'll be implemented, like uh, mm -hmm. Japanese reparations were in 1981. You know, they will say, we need to start doing this, and we will allocate money for that. So uh, we're about, I mean, to use a football analogy, we're probably in the mid part of the fourth quarter about getting HR 40 passed. 
And a year ago, we were probably at halftime. Hmm. Great. It's important. Important work. Yeah, important work. Important work. Other questions? Um, now, one question that often comes up is, who would get reparations? Who would be eligible? <laughs> if we want to wade into that that controversy, <laughs> particularly in the context of right, if there are direct payments that are part well, of the you know, strategy. I'll, I'll always jokingly say that you know, if reparations pass, which it will in the next couple of years, that people, white folks, are going to start declaring their black ancestry that they've been hiding for many, many years. Uh, and uh, and I actually have had people after seminars on reparations who are classified. That, that's why I always use the term people classified as white. They have actually come up to me after uh, a meeting. This happened right before the uh, COVID up in Detroit. I was giving a speech and the guy said, he said, look, I know for a fact that my great grandfather was black. Now, if I, you know, phenotypically, he looked white genotypically he was admitting that he had black blood and we all know the run drop rule so i think that who gets reparations are those who have been impacted by enslavement it's a real simple and the vast majority of those people of course were africans in this country but there are a lot of people uh, when i taught down south it's estimated that 60 percent of white people below the Mason and Dixon line have black ancestry. And I mean, we know the Elizabeth Warren story relative to indigenous people, but there are white people who have, they know that they have black ancestry, but they don't like to talk about it. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, you, you raised a, a different, uh, a very uh, interesting question. Reparations doing enslavement and reparations moving through Jim Crow and 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 forward. And we know what the policies were around Jim Crow, uh, denial of wealth, uh, zoning ordinances and all those things that, that kept us um, uh, restricted in terms of our economic movement. So are we talking uh, or should we be talking uh, 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 separate uh, uh, discussions on reparations, the reparations that took place during our enslavement of our ancestors, and the, the reparations that that took wealth from 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 black folks from probably the nineteen twenties on forward. Well, see, I don't separate those. Okay. I mean, yeah, wealth was taken from black. I mean, you know, Richard America, who's a black economist at George Washington University in D.C., he estimates that if you were to transfer the wealth that Americans, white Americans got as a result of enslavement, we have to remember, uh, it was, it's in Edward Baptiste's book, um, the, ha the Half Has Not Been Told, that the number one industry in this country prior to the Civil War was enslavement. Mm -hmm. It wasn't textiles, it wasn't crops or anything else like that, it was enslavement. That was the number one business, if you please, in this country. And so I don't separate all of that. I look at the, you know, from 1619, if you want to use that as a date, all the way up, uh, you know, through the Jim Crow era to the 1960s and how much money, uh, you know, Black folk lost during that period collectively. And how do you compensate that in some small way? Mm -hmm. Well, some of the work that Amber has done up in Chicago looked at looked, looked at that question in terms of contract selling and how it was used yeah. to exploit wealth from from black um, homeowners in, in 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 that city. Yeah, I mean Tanahasi's work, Amber. I'm sure you came across the 2014 article that he wrote on reparations. I mean, that's if I were to say what one book you ought to read beside mine. I would say read Tanahasi's article mm -hmm. um, on reparations because what he did brilliantly, most of us started enslavement and moved up. 
so that people will say, well, that was, you know, people use the, you know, opposers will say, uh, well, that was then and this is now. What Ta-Nehisi did so brilliantly was start today and move mm -hmm. back backwards. And so by the time you get to reading that article, he said, we got to give these people reparations. And I think that's why that article is so important. It's critical. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so what about our, the arguments against reparations, right? One we hear is, where's the money going to come from? We don't have the money <laughs> for this. But see, what happened last was in October of last year when uh, our dear president passed the tax break for very wealthy people. What was it, 1.2 trillion? And what happened just a few months ago with with the you know the uh, the stimulus as a result of the pandemic with two point? I think again we don't even understand how money works. It's not like there's a guy up there in the treasury said, well look we can only make so much money. All they do is print it. I don't know if you remember when Barack was president, he was going to create a trillion dollar coin, just a one coin worth one trillion dollars. Money is what people say it is. And so when people say we don't have enough money, that's just not true. You know, mm -hmm. and I mean, that's a whole other discussion too. Yeah, the people, they find the money for what they think is important and what they value, right? They do. We were pressing reparations right before I had gone to the World Conference Against Racism in South Africa in 2001, 19 years ago. And in fact, when I was flying back, you know, that's when 9-11 occurred. And the day after 9-11 occurred, there was $1 trillion allocated by the government to, quote, fight terrorism. So money is not what a lot of people think it is. But that's, again, that's another discussion. And I'll also add, there were 9-11 reparations given. Exactly. The victims' families, there was money to do that. Sandy Hook had reparations. Um, so they're many. all recent US reparations. That's right. That's um, right. The only issue with that is like, there's the money. We just have to make sure in terms of inflation, just how we dole that out to those we deem qualifying participants. Um, but the money is there, the money. Right. And then I would also wanted to add that there's different models out there. So I wanna plug uh, Sandy Darity's book, From Here to Equality, which lays out um, reparations and talks about right. a plan. How do we identify who qualifies? And one of the things to your point, All of that's about amazing. those who have, who will then come out the woodworks with um, a black self-identification. One of the qualifications that he posits is having to have identified as Black, Negro, African-American, whatever the classification was for at least the last 12 years to have to show. Um, right. Because, yeah. Hmm. That's a good show that. mm -hmm. and, I, and we need to tax billionaires and we need to use eminent domain. It's not like our, you know, different government, state governments haven't used eminent domain for very powerful institutions. These are legal tools that can be used. Sadly, lawyers are part of the establishment. Um, Dr. Winbush, I'm going to take your comment as a charge to organize attorneys around this issue. Um, because we know that there are tools that exist. And it's true. I think we, in terms of movement lawyers, we are only at our best when we have a movement behind us that's informing us how to execute our duties and not usurping those we positions. We'll talk about that because we need to. You know Roger Ware, I'm up in New York. I do not. Okay, you will after I get to talk to you. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think those attorneys are going to be important, right? I, we were looking at an RFP where from a city we're trying to figure out what's, what's, what's legal, what they're able to do. And so there is, you know, you know, we, we talked about the city of, uh, uh, of Evanston and Asheville, but, you know, other locations, they're trying to figure out what they can do. Um, and so lawyers are going to be really um, of helping folks figure that out. And even with programs that are well known and long established in terms of minority women business um, status, we've seen how that's been taken advantage of in terms of, you know, 
it'll really be a, a, a white business that will get a few people of color to join and then take advantage mm -hmm. of that status. Right. Or it'll be a business that's ready. It truly is, you know, 51%. Um, and not, I'm, I'm not going to focus on women for this part, but black owned businesses that really just need to be able to navigate that paperwork. And it is very cumbersome paperwork. Um, and, you know, a lot of legalese and we've been doing that kind of work as well to help people gain access. But I wouldn't call that reparations. No, I, I wouldn't call it reparations. Um, I wouldn't call that reparations. I would call that black wealth development, but not reparations. So mm -hmm. I, I think, like, I'm, I'm always really grateful to be in spaces like this that remind me of what do I have to circle back to? Who do I need to regroup with? What's the best way strategically to move forward so that we're lifting our voices in a way that actually then leads to outcomes? Um, and actually, I'm really quite embarrassed that when you threw out the question of, well, who's doing the reparations work, no group jumped to my mind. Um, yeah. That's just a self-reflection, which, which to me means I'm going to then do that work and I'll reach out to organizations, I'll reach out to Dr. Ben Bush um, connects me with. And I, you know, and I think sometimes we're, there's so much work to be done that we tend to work in silos when we really mm -hmm. need to be working with each other. So right, I'm, yeah. I'm thankful both to the Network for Developing Conflict Communities and the Center for Urban and Racial Equity for bringing us together because it's not always easy. I mean, now it's a little bit easier because we're all kind of stuck at home. But even when we're not stuck at home, these, you were holding these conferences and bringing us together. So I'm, I am deeply grateful for that. Well, thank you. Thank, yeah, uh, thank you, Carmen. And that's, I think that's the charge, right, for us this evening is, you know, to, to find those organizations, those groups that are already, that's already doing this work. Um, and as we, you know, Dr. Winbush, you know, said so, so clearly, right, that, you know, we need, we need the students, we need the, the, the scholars, we need the activists. All of us have a role in making this this uh, possible and real. Um, so there's a question here about how do we speak with one voice? It, it is connecting, right? That we're not we're not in silos, right? That we're actually knowing what's going on. In other, right? And that you know, oftentimes in these conversations, people will ask, um, well things aren't moving forward, there's no activity. And, and there's a lot of, act, right? Oftentimes it's not, there's a lot of activity going on. And so it's up for us, up to us now to, to find um, where we can connect, you know, where we can connect and plug in and, and contribute. Ron, you have a few, uh, a few things to uh, share before we wrap up? Uh, first of all, let me just thank um, the panelists for joining us this evening. Um, I know we did it right in the middle of your dinner hour. Uh, hopefully you got some, something on the stove cooking good. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I really appreciate it. Uh, words that are a, a reflection of uh, 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 echoing out your 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 appreciation. But my heartfelt um, spirit says that it's, it's good to be in a space working with folks like you. Um, and so I'm, again, I'm gonna remain optimistic that the, you know, that a change is gonna come Changes are happening um, <laughs> incrementally as we speak, but I think that we're going to see some explosive changes as, as these years begin to, to progress further. Um, I was one of those naysayers back in uh, about 10 years ago, 12, well, 13 years ago when Barack was running for office. I did not believe out of my experiences that we would, that this country was ready for a black, black may, um, president because I only seen the other side of America. So I, I'm going to um, hold that optimism, um, that audacity of hope, as he says, that um, that we're going to be able to mobilize and get this movement uh, going. Um, we're going to be concluding our discussions next week. And and Ray, you've given us a, a really call to action in terms of this House Bill uh, 40, in terms of being able to mobilize and get some some leverage around these 12 uh, uh, legislators who have not moved. And so uh, I'm I'm gonna uh, wait for your email and we're gonna get that out um, to the folks who have attended this, um, 
these series over the last several weeks and encourage them to, to go forth and write and put pressure on these folks to get their signatures on that bill. Um, and then I'm going to come back with all of you. If you got some um, take, we're going to, this is being recorded. And so we'll have some takeaways that we're going to be talking with folks about next week in terms of our thoughts about a call to action. So we know we have a, a, a rally, um, a march that's coming up in August. I think it's August the 28th. And, and certainly we want to be able to, to drive uh, uh, some conversation around that uh, because again, it's about mobilizing um, folks, but also taking those, those steps towards actionable actions. And so we're in a moment now, we need action. I remember my pledging day that we used to say, action, action, we want action, ACT, I win. That's what we need now, action. Um, we, we've heard lip service now for too too long, far too long. And so it's time for folks to, to, to know that there is money and resources to do this work. This work is needed. And one of the things I'm, I'm always reminded of is that Kerner re, re, Commission report that came out uh, after the uprising in, in, in Detroit in 67. And one of the things that, that still stands on mind, they said it was two divided Americans, one black and one white. And I hope that we can um, come to grips with, with, with mending that in, in uh, at some point in time, maybe in my lifetime or my grandkids' la lifetime, my niece's lifetime, mend this racial divide in this in this country. But I know that atonement is going to be a, a part of that. And 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 as Carmen said about and Ray said about, you busted my window, repair it. And so we, we're asking America to repair the wrongs that it has done, and so we can get to healing. So without that repair, we're not going to get to that point of fully healing. So again, thank you all for sharing with us uh, this evening. I really appreciate your your um, um, participation, uh, Dr. Judy. It's been a, a wonderful pleasure. We got one more session to go, and I'm certainly uh, um, appreciative of Kirk um, accepting the invitation to join us on this journey. Um, but again, it just says what we said earlier before we got on the air. When you got work to do, you got more work to do. So, so we're gonna get busy. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Dr. Winbush. Thank you, Carmen. And thank you to our audience. Have a good evening. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.